Yes, they are. All right, gang, we're going to get started. Um, thanks, for, thanks for coming, and I'm glad the weather held for us. It's a good sign. Um, for those of you who uh, don't know me, my name is Dick Pullman, and I teach in the writing program here, journalism, uh, and uh, freelance regularly uh, uh, writing about politics for different sites, which I'm not going to do uh, free advertising for today. Uh, but um, uh, And you also, if you haven't met me, I also have uh, three or four guests uh, here at the Writer's House every semester. I bring in visiting journalists, as we are doing today. Um, and just to mention very quickly uh, the three other events I have coming up since this is the first. Uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer has a Metro columnist by the name of Helen Ubinas, U-B-I-N-A-S, uh, Metro columnist who basically covers, uh, I guess you'd say, the mean streets of Philadelphia, uh, finding people living, struggling in their everyday lives um, and getting a lot of voices into the Inquirer who really need to be in the newspaper. Um, so Helen's going to be joining me either on this stage or back indoors, who knows, on October 15th, uh, Monday the 15th. Uh, and then after that, uh, since we're going to be in and around the midterm elections, you know, I'm doing politics again. So we're going to have a couple uh, speakers who are uh, well-versed in that. The first one is October 24th, which is a Wednesday. Uh, it's a New York University professor, actually by the name of uh, Jay Rosen, uh, who writes um, basically a lot about how the media covers Trump. And I think that's an important issue as we get closer to the midterms. Uh, and he has a, a very um, popular um, website of his own called PressThink, PressThink.org. Uh, so we're going to be talking a lot about, about politics, but really the media coverage of politics as we get closer to the election and how you deal with fake news and so-called fake news, et cetera. Um, and then in November, November 15th, and this is a Thursday, uh, Wash I'm going to host Washington Post political columnist uh, Dana Milbank, uh, who is um, a f not only good but very funny, uh, kind of a mainstay on MSNBC for any of you who may have recognized the name if you haven't read him. Um, so that's the 15th of November. Uh, but that brings us back to today. Um, our guest today um, is uh, presently uh, the uh, Washington correspondent at the, uh, are there more than one at the? Uh, yeah, there's a two right now. Okay, at the Minneapolis Star Tribune. So uh, Maya works in Washington, uh, but um, she got her start actually, uh, if I remember the long read interview, uh, at the press, uh, the Atlantic City newspaper, uh, and then was at the Philadelphia Inquirer for a few years. And, um, has, and then uh, from Minneapolis started getting really interested in uh, this North Dakota oil boom uh, and sort of uh, was uh, curious and driven to uh, go out there and embed herself heavily uh, in a complete, in an environment completely different from what you were used to, which is that in and of itself I find an interesting thing to talk about. So we will talk about it. We will take questions, of course, from the audience, uh, but let's uh, welcome Maya Rayo. <laughs> Hold up your book, and I didn't even mention it. it all culminated in this book that came out earlier this year, uh, and we'll talk about that. What's that like, sort of being a kind of a, a daily journalist and, and then deciding a, to write a book? Um, but start. let's just start, since a lot of people here may not know uh, about what happened in North Dakota, the North Dakota oil boom. Um, if you can... Uh, I don't want to say 25 words or less, but uh, you know, let's make it hundreds of words or less. G give everybody sort of a concise recap of what it was that happened there and what drove you to want to be there, and then we can proceed from that. So probably a lot of you have followed some of the controversies about fracking in western Pennsylvania, um, but Pennsylvania is not the only state that has had big advances in fracking. Um, you know, this took off in Texas, Oklahoma, and North Dakota. And really in North Dakota, it was probably the most dramatic. Um, uh, this was a very faded frontier that had, you know, was declining in population, that was economically depressed, and then suddenly advances in fracking led this national oil rush to take off. People from all over the country, and even the globe came to 
uh, start over to get a job, to drill for oil, to escape the law, run a drug trafficking ring. I mean, it was pretty much every last sort of person you could imagine all converging in this area in the Northern Plains. Um, that was really like a modern day California gold rush or a Klondike gold rush. And so I just knew the potential to find great stories, um, both investigative feature stories. I, I just knew that that would be a great place to be a journalist. Um, and that I really wanted to do it as a book as opposed to sort of seeing a lot of journalists coming in and parachuting in, parachuting out. I felt like there was something there that was not being effectively captured by you know, average news stories. So I wanted to put in the time. There was a, one term that you used, I think it was in the first, uh, the, maybe the preface of the book, the introduction, excuse me, where you said that it was a classic kind of, it was a classic story about Darwinian capitalism. And yes. what did you mean, what do you mean by that? So this was an area that was just purely driven by free enterprise, um, that everything was about money, the free market was the solution to everything. Um, uh, everything could be bought or sold that you could imagine. Um, and I, I thought this was sort of unusual compared to many other parts of the country. You know, long before Bernie Sanders began campaigning on a $15 minimum wage, the free market in Western North Dakota had already effectively um, set that through supply and demand. Uh, there were so many jobs available due to the need for oil companies to drill and frack for oil that anybody could come and get a job um, at a certain point as long as they could pass a drug test. And if they couldn't, they could easily fake that. Um, a lot of people like to fake that. But um, uh, it was just a place where um, everything was really just driven by the desire for profit. Yeah. So, okay, so the, you were working for the Minneapolis paper yes. when you started getting interested in this. What, had you ever, uh, in your uh, journalism career, which at that point was what, five or six years out of school by that point? At that time I was about seven years out of school. Okay, seven years out yeah. of school. Had you ever um, covered or Im Im uh, embedded yourself in any milieu that was anything like that before? No, actually, I spent most of my life um, on the East Coast, in the mid-Atlantic, in major metropolitan areas. Um, this was my first time really being in the middle of the country, being in an area that was very, not just rural, um, because you can find rural America in Pennsylvania, but really remote. Um, people who got certain kinds of oil field injuries had to be flown you know, 600 miles away to the nearest burn center. I mean, that's how remote it was. So that. That, that was very new to me. And um, I know a lot of people talk about that you should write something that you know or that maybe something that you're already familiar with. I, I'm always driven by things that I don't know. Um, and I had, this was all so new to me. I had not been in an environment um, that was that remote, that was in the Northern Plains. Um, I had not been around a lot of blue collar folks. And th there was a lot of white collar people and investors in the book too, but I had not spent time you know, on oil rigs. There's no one in my family who has just driven a truck or anything like that. Mm. So that this was all completely new. Okay, so I, I, the reason I asked you that question was, and you kind of just said this, but maybe you can just sort of reiterate. For some of the students who are here, the importance of getting out of one's comfort zone um, that, that, that's the way perhaps to challenge yourself or stretch yourself and find out things about yourself. I don't mean to prompt you on the answer, but mm -hmm. I assume that's sort of what the importance about getting out of your comfort zone is about, right? Yeah, and I mean, I think I, I was very well served by having already been a newspaper reporter for seven years by that point. So I had a degree of comfort that I would not have had early in my career. By that point, um, you know, things that used to intimidate me, even something as simple as covering like a legislative hearing at a state house. When I was young in my career, that sounded scary for some reason. Um, but once you start d conquering more and more challenges as a daily newspaper reporter, then you get more confidence that then it's much easier to go out and get out of your comfort zone. But I still think um, no matter what stage you are in your career, that's really important to not be intimidated about um, going off into a different area. And um, all right, so when you first mentioned this to your, to your editors that you wanted to do this or you wanted some time off to spend a lot of time out there, were they receptive to it? 
Were they resistant to it? And this, this I'm setting up a, se a separate question. Sure. But. <laughs> um, so, so I initially just would, um, you know, go out on on my vacation time or personal time. I would drive out there. And driving ten hours to the oil field in the Midwest, that's like <laughs> driving to New York. You know, there's in the Midwest, just driving long distances is just normal. So. Uh, yeah, I, w I would start off just going on my own and collecting material, and then when I had enough and, and had a book deal ready, then I went to them, and I was worried they would not agree, um, but they did. And I think, um, you know, I was also working at a newspaper that was very financially sound at that point, and I'm, I think that there's a number of newspapers that if th they're not doing well and everyone has to write three stories a day, then that would be really impossible to maybe go to them. But, um, but I worked at a paper that was doing pretty well at that point, so it was maybe an easier sell. So, all right, so by the time that, uh, by the time you were coming back with the idea of doing this book, they were already well accustomed to your self-driven ways, can <laughs> I put it that way? The r what I'm asking yeah. you is, there's a, there's a quote in the book, in the first chapter, I think it is, uh, the book opens with uh, a sort of a mini portrait of a uh, trucker named Danny. Mm -hmm. And you spend a lot of time with Danny, and he's got an amazing backstory of his own. But somewhere along in there, you say to him, or he's talking about how independent he is, and then you say to him uh, that you agree that I don't like being told what to do. This is you <laughs> talking that you don't like being told what to do. Now, is that is that... Um, um, does a journalist, you know, obviously a lot of journalists, you know, you work with editors, editors can be good, they can help you, great deal, but is there something about that not being told what to do, a certain kind of independence of spirit that you think goes along with being a journalist? Yeah, definitely, and in the, in the scene, um, just to add something else I said, uh, I was just saying I'd always felt ambivalent about working for other people, right. and I think that there's probably many journalists who could say the same thing. Um, and I, that's why I wanted to do my own project. So I think you have to have a certain mentality to be a journalist, but then to do this kind of work, it's actually a bit different. Um, it's, you have to be very self-guided. You don't really have a real editor. I mean, you have an editor at a publishing house, but an editor at a publishing house doesn't know anything about journalism necessarily. They're there to kind of edit the writing style at the end but they're not an expert on doing field work or you know, reporting. So you really have to go out and, and do it on your own and, and you get into a lot of unpredictable situations. And so, um, and, and it's something that's very hard to kind of come in having a set, certain set of rules or guidelines that you know you'll follow, um, which is uh, I think a little easier to do. You know, when, you're, when you work for a newspaper and cover a beat, you sort of know everything that you have to do. It's more mm -hmm. cut and dry, more institutional. But going off on your own is, is really a, a different situation, um, especially when you're a year in the field. So you definitely have to have a different mentality for that. Well, all right, so let's, let's, um, let's just um, flash back a little bit to when you were yo really young, yeah. really <laughs> young, like a kid. Okay, so I mean, I've noticed, what I've noticed with students that I've had over the years is that they come to these classes in part because there's something in instinctive. You know, they have an instinctive hunger to tell stories, to write, to, to find things out, tell people about them. Uh, and it's been with them since, you know, they're very young. I mean, I know I felt that. Um, in your case, how did you, how, how and when did you first know that you wanted to write? How did that manifest itself? Oh, I was writing books since I was nine years old, basically, and spiral notebooks and pencil. But yeah, I've always loved to read and write. I, I knew since I was in elementary school that I wanted to, to write books one day. And um, uh, really, unlike a lot of journalists I know, um, I think many journalists sort of consider themselves like a newspaper reporter first, and then they happen to do a book based on their reporting, uh, and they're an author too, but they're sort of always that newspaper reporter first. And for me, I felt like I was always an author first. And, you know, the news background was just kind of a way to help me gain the skills to do that and to, you know, it's, it's something that is still a great job, but I've thought of myself as an author first for a long time. All right, so what were your first plots about? <laughs> um, were, were, they were you just writing mystery? mystery? Yeah, you like mis mystery, mystery novels, yeah. yeah. <laughs> About kids. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you make? Did you have siblings? You, yeah, you have yeah siblings? I had you, a younger sister. Did you make her read them? 
I made my mom read them. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, actually, all right. So you thought of yourself as an author first. I mean, does it? Do you think? And, and it's funny because journalists fall into two categories about what I'm about to ask you, which is that some of them, some of them like the reporting more than the writing. You know, they really love the reporting and they dread getting to the point where they have to actually sit down and put it together. And some people are the exact opposite. You know, they want to just get through to the get through the reporting, do what they have to do, so they can sit down and just marinate in the actual writing. Do you have a preference for those two? Um, I Between those two. Yeah. I, no, I actually like writing, but for a project like this, for a book that requires a lot of field work and a lot of reporting, I really prefer that reporting process because that takes less mental work for some reason. I mean, it's a lot of it is like you take notes, you observe people in action, it's interesting. And the hard work at, for me is actually sitting down and like putting it together into something coherent. Yeah, and so does, um, do you spend a lot of time, just on one writing question on this, do you spend a disproportionate amount of time on the opening, on the, the, the lead, as it were, you know, that, that you know, the, uh, you've got to get the top mm -hmm. down to grab people's attention. Is that, is that what would you say is the toughest part of the actual writing process? I was throwing mm -hmm. that out as one option. Oh, you mean for the book or just in, in general? Well, the book, let's, yeah, let's, let's use the book. You know, you um, to decide yeah, how to so open it with Danny. It must have been for right. a reason. So I actually wrote this book out of order um, oh. because I think you can get really stuck trying to think of this perfect opening and you could just spend a lot of time staring at your computer um, but for me, I, I sort of knew the different aspects I wanted to put in. Um, and so I just wrote out of order. I wrote all the different scenes I would need to. And I really just, I knew generally where the opening would start. I just didn't want to get to writing it. So I, I waited till the end, actually. Wow. Now, okay. <laughs> that, that sounds, worst that part that sounds for the awfully end. hard. <laughs> um, um, well, all right. Well, here this is this is something that uh, I get asked a lot in class, um, and maybe you're just very good at this. You tell me how much you have to work at this. The the challenge for some people, anyway, of having to approach strangers and and to say, I want to talk to you. I'm writing something. I'm a reporter, whatever. The idea of approaching strangers and getting them to relax enough to talk to you so that you can take notes and have a conversation that's uh, essentially on the record. Uh, are there any general, is there any general advice that from your own experience, you know, the idea of, do you ever like seize up before you go up to strangers or do you just like naturally um, loquacious, friendly? What's the way to do it? Well, I'm, I'm actually not naturally this really extroverted, outgoing, talkative person, but I find that in doing the kind of work I had to do for my book, that really wasn't a big deal at all. I mean, people actually like to talk to someone who is sort of quieter and is not trying to really get in their face and, and you know, dominate the conversation. So I felt like um, people often told me it didn't seem like I had an agenda and that's actually a big thing. Um, to report a book like mine, I, I had to overcome this challenge, like a lot of reporters, where people in Western North Dakota were very wary of the media. They believed that the media had some sort of anti-fracking bias, um, or at least a liberal bias. And so coming in as someone who seems like not intrusive, or, or um, who seems like they don't have an agenda, that was really um, very helpful. And people also could see that I was kind of, I kept coming back to them, or I was willing to hang out there and live there, so that went a long way. But I have to tell you, I mean, especially at the beginning, I had a lot of people did not want to talk to me, and I know other reporters who went up there had the same problem. So you have to sort of be kind of persistent and acknowledge there's just a lot of people that may not talk to you at all, but you have to s approach enough people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the right one. They, they, they have to sort of, if they see you yeah. coming back and back, they know that you're really, in, that you're really interested yes. in, you're not just sort of, you know, here today and gone tomorrow. Right. Um, well, one of the things that you did that I found really interesting, and you talked about this in that interview in Long Read, I think mm -hmm. it was, was that you went out and you got your, s and you got a job as a, as a cashier mm -hmm. at a truck stop. Yep. And you were there for over a month yes. as a cashier. Um, what, all right, so you're, and you're just, you know, meeting people and you're talking to them there. At what point, as a cashier, did you then start telling people that you were 
really in the area as a journalist, uh, because I think you mentioned something in the, uh, in the q and A in, in Long Reads, uh, that you were, uh, and I'm paraphrasing your quote, uh, kind of struggling with the ethics logistics of, yes. of that issue. And so how did you play, how did that play out? How did you decide how to mm -hmm. do that? So for those kinds of situations, um, for any journalist who's kind of working somewhere, they hope to eventually make an article or book out of it. Um, it's really important that you can't lie to anybody. So on my job application, I, I left out my latest job at the Minneapolis Star Tribune, but I did put the Philadelphia Inquirer. Maybe I put Philadelphia Media Network or something. So they <laughs> but uh, anyway, at that time, they were so desperate for cashiers that they would hire anybody. <laughs> and Honestly, a lot of people in Western North Dakota, I think they've probably not heard of the Philadelphia Inquirer or the Press of Atlantic City or, I mean, um, <laughs> the, well, the people just don't, Great. It, 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 people just don't really <laughs> engage with the media much, I've noticed. Um, everyone watches Fox News, I'm just saying they don't. Do they know an East Coast paper? Not really. Um, and then a couple weeks, and I did, I just told people I was hoping to do a freelance article and write a book out there again, nobody would care if you said that. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know, I just people just thought, oh sure, you're writing a book. You know, a lot of people say they wanna write a book. <laughs> I'm standing there in a cashier uniform, <laughs> kind of young looking, and they're like, okay, sure. Um, and people were used to reporters coming in, and ev like not just reporters, but a lot of people wanting to study the area and do a film about it or a TV show, so they're sort of used to somebody coming in and saying things like that. But um, what I would try to do from behind the uh, counter as a cashier was when I would meet interesting customers, I would take their contact information and then interview them off site after work or see if I could accompany them to an oil site. And then later, you know, I came to the owners and told them and they, they were okay with it. I, I didn't, I didn't like take notes about people who I was going to name without them knowing what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But I did take notes of a lot of people that were not named, kind of the chatter at the cash register of the different customers coming through. Right, because you can still get, yeah, you can still get verisimilitude and some yeah. of that kind of texture of where mm -hmm. you were without having to necessarily hook it around people, you know, yeah. at least to get started and to yeah. get the feel of the place. Yeah. You know, and because, uh, um, you know, there have been, uh, I know there have been investigations, and I mean, I'm thinking one of them was one of the Chicago papers did this thing. This was years ago, where a bunch of reporters they actually opened a bar, they opened yeah. a bar, you know, uh, in order to catch, I don't know, aldermen or something that they were doing something sleazy, and they needed a place to meet, and they would come to this bar, and it was all staffed by journalists who were n who were just identifying themselves as bartenders, and there was, you know, there was argument at the time about whether that was you know, whether that under, that kind of undercover journalism yeah. was, in fact, journalism uh, or unfair to mm -hmm. the people they were targeting. Um, so but so did you, you kind of just sort of worked that through as you did it, or did you go in with that as, as the plan to sort of slowly unmask yeah, I plan yourself? Yeah, yeah, kind of just to gradually do that. And it worked out for me, because I wasn't trying to catch anyone in some sort of gotcha moment or investigate the chuck stuff or... <laughs> embezzling money or anything like that. So it was, you know, I was coming into it not with any goal to, to um, necessarily make anybody at the truck stop look bad, mm -hmm. you know. Did, did um, so did you tape, did you, I shouldn't say tape, that shows how old I am. Yeah. Did you digitally record all your yeah. interviews um, and do you take notes to back that up in case it, um, it mm -hmm. in case of your uh, phone malfunctions? I mean. Uh, yeah. What's the process for that? Because there's this whole thing about taking notes versus recording. Right. Yeah, I actually do. I did record a lot of things on my iPhone, um, uh, and then uh, I, uh, I would just upload them onto my computer later. But I was spending a lot of time transcribing, and uh, that just eats up tons and tons of time. Um, so whenever possible, as clumsy as this is, I mean, if I could just... Sometimes just take my computer out, like especially this guy, Danny, who's a, he's a truck driver, so if I was in the passenger seat and he's talking to me on the way to an oil site, I would just take my computer out, put it on my lap, and just type straight into the computer while he was talking. It saved tons of time because Danny's very talkative, and uh, I didn't want to transcribe, you know, a long conversation. Um, and then I, sometimes I did, I did take notes, too, on my, you know, by hand. 
But it definitely got frustrating after a while to always record. So I would always look for some way around having to do that. Yeah, if right. I, I know, because that's yeah. like, you didn't want to go to a transcription service and pay an enormous amount yeah, of money. Yeah, that, that's a lot of money, uh, and yeah. I just feel uncomfortable trusting somebody else to transcribe it. And right. Well, and you were doing this on, a lot of this on your own, and you want to yeah. run up your own costs. Right. I mean, you were doing this, as they say in the freelance world, you were doing this on spec, in yeah. a way. You know, you were thinking maybe there was going to be a book at the end, but... You know, uh, yeah, well, yeah, at first, and then, yeah, even after I got the book deal, you know, I, st I still was still working out all the exact contours of the story. I and mean, you had to really, I mean, this is to set up another question. I mean, you had to really believe in this story in order to spend mm -hmm. this much time on it, not yeah. necessarily knowing how it was going to pay off mm -hmm. in the end, right, yeah. creatively or journalistically, that it was going to necessarily have an, uh, you know, a uh, result right. in a book. So, um, I guess is this just a question that you know if you're if you're if you're motivated enough as a journalist you have to that you have to trust your instincts in a mm -hmm. story and that I mean you know mm -hmm. a lot of journalists really depend on the instant gratification yes. I think <laughs> of writing something having it posted seeing it a few hours later I know I do um, mm -hmm. but the idea of putting out two years or three years or four years on a book um, you know it sounds you know like almost like a gamble. Yeah. Um, but you felt strongly enough in the story that it was going to pay off anyway. Or you just saw no choice because you were so invested in it that you <laughs> wanted to see it through? What's the more Yeah, accurate? okay, so I definitely had moments of doubt uh, sort of temporarily throughout the process. But um, I always knew that I would come through when, with an interesting book. I did believe in what I was doing. Um, but it was very stressful, not necessarily knowing how things would work out. And there was a lot of twists and turns. And this is actually, the project I did, um, I don't think it would necessarily come through if anybody read the book, but it was actually extremely difficult. And maybe I would say for any be beginner in that process, maybe, you know, um, maybe you should think twice about doing something that difficult. Just because in the environment I was in, I mean, you meet so many sort of shady characters, difficult characters, you're in a difficult terrain, kind of dangerous. Um, and so all of that just added to a lot of stress in the moment. So I had to have some kind of long-term uh, agenda. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. All right, well, in terms yeah. of the stress, there's one, there's one question I haven't asked you, uh, which I think is important, and, and when you just mm -hmm. mentioned the danger of the terrain and the stress, it's perfect mm -hmm. segue which is basically, you know, you went in there, you know, uh, a young woman mm -hmm. doing heavy reporting and embedding himself in a, you know, large, heavily male, you know, rough and tumble environment. Um, certainly that's another way of getting outside your comfort zone. How did you, were there times there where you had to um, navigate that in a, you know, in a very um, delicate way. I mean, obviously some sources, I think I remember from the Q&A that some of the people whose names you took that you wanted to talk to as sources, you know, they would be calling you back and calling you back and you realized they weren't calling you back a lot for uh, professional reasons. So, I mean, how did you navigate all that? Right. Well, that's, um, there's a couple ways that came into play. I mean, I've, I guess I've never been intimidated to be in a male-dominated environment, but I think that's a case-by-case -case basis. I wouldn't necessarily say that all women should just jump into the oil field. Uh, I mean, it's not really, it's not always that easy. Um, one of the things that surprised me was just how patriarchal that society is, and in many yeah. ways they believe in this gender segregation. So at like one point it was very hard for me to find housing. You know, housing is very expensive in an oil boom town and uh, so you often have to f have housemates or share some costs. And so I was going on Craigslist and finding a couple times, you know, landlords did not want to rent to me when they learned I was a woman. So I had to find- Isn't that against I, the law? It doesn't matter if it's against the law. That's what they, <laughs> <laughs> that place is like a big target for an EEOC investigation, but uh, they, they're not worried about it. Um, uh, no, they, they were concerned about if there's a, a, a woman living in a room 
And then there's other men in the house that, that the woman won't do anything wrong, but if a guy does something wrong, then the landlord's liable, and it's just better to just segregate everybody. Mm. Um, and I heard people on, in the oil business just openly talking about how like a lot of women can do a lot of these jobs on oil sites. They really can. They're not as physically demanding as you would think, but they just don't want... They don't want to mix women in with the male crew because the male, some guy in the crew is going to get a crush on her and then uh, flirt with her and cause some kind of problems and fights and then it's going to disrupt their ability to work. And so uh, it was very old fashioned, very, very strange. I'm not used to really hearing people talk like that. So anyway, I had to live with this um, all female, uh, in an all female house. It was like a place where they had these, um, uh, a house cleaning company, and they had some extra rooms um, for people in addition to the employees. So I was there for a while, and I actually did, I mean, there were male acquaintances where I crashed in trailer parks and farmhouses, so it's not like I didn't live with men as well. But uh, that, that was something that caught me off guard. Um, and um, I, I do, th on, on the other hand, um, because, because of that patriarchal attitude that you saw there, a lot of men did not find a woman particularly threatening, which which can be s somewhat that can be helpful if you're trying to get access to oil sites and and trying to trying to hang around on a rig. They'd, their guard is not as much up around you, and they're more likely to see you as as just a nice person doing their job. They're not going to be as hostile to you. Um, mm. So so yeah, there's a lot of different things like that. Um, but I, I should clarify, so I write about Danny, the truck driver. He's not a long-haul truck driver. I didn't, like, move into his truck or anything like that. <laughs> These truck drivers only travel, like, one hour each way often within the area. So I already knew the area very well. You know, I didn't have to, um, you know, I could pick and choose when I saw people, uh, you know, on my own yeah. comfort level. Did, um, I, have, I just actually just want to ask one more question, and then I was going to hopefully – uh, get you all uh, into the conversation here. So, and we are going to have a microphone uh, back there. The only right. The only other question uh, that I wanted to, before I forgot was, and we kind of touched on this a little bit already. Um, you were interested in this story. You were driven by the story. You saw all the ram potential ramifications and the big themes, which mm -hmm. you talk a lot about in the introduction of the book. Um, uh, did you ever? Did you ever? Uh, so it interests you. Did you ever worry that it wouldn't find a sufficient audience? I guess what I'm saying is, you, you know, you right. talk sometimes, you see interviews with musicians sometimes, professional mm -hmm. musicians. I think Neil Young did this once. They said, you know, do you ever worry about, you know, whether your songs are going to find an audience? And he said in his cranky way uh, that, uh, you know, goes, well, you know, I just figure, you know, if I'm interested in the songs and I like the songs, I figure there's got to be enough people who are going to like the yeah. songs too. It, does that come close to what you were... You know, I mean, you wanted to get a book out of it, yeah. and people might say, well, you know, it's not going to sell as much as Bob Woodward's book or whatever, but is that mm -hmm. immaterial if you're sufficiently invested in a story? I think it's definitely something to consider. Um, like, I really believed in what I was doing, and one thing that surprised me, I know it shouldn't be a surprise, but there is a certain coastal... Um, liberal bias that can come into play with how these sorts of books are treated. And I've been surprised yeah. to see, um, you know, books on fracking in, um, in Pennsylvania get more attention, even though fracking was a much bigger deal in North Dakota. And you also see some books on fracking that where the <coughs> author is has um, the liberal bias that my sources, my all Republican sources in North Dakota uh, are very wary of, but just people who are sort of anti-fracking are you know, anti-Trump, um, and so in my reporting, I, I didn't want to come in with that kind of agenda because I wanted to write it sort of from the point of view of people who were there right, on the ground. And and right, yeah, and yeah. it's um, mm -hmm. so I have found sometimes it is hard to connect with book reviewers or, or people in the book world who kind of can look at that and think, oh, that's just something in middle America or rural small towns, or it's a bunch of Trump supporters. Um, and I, so I do think there's that there's still that bias you have to push past when you're trying to write about rural America, um, and it's um, so I am in the midst of thinking about sort of in, in my next project how I want to handle that because I believe that we need more 
reporting on these types of things, but you do have to balance that with thinking, um, you know, what, what does a broad audience, um, you know, want, want to read about? Right, well, it's, yeah. uh, it's credit to the publisher there that they yeah. did go with this project and, yeah. you know, the promoting it. Yeah, it's, well, this is a national story. I mean, it happened in North Dakota, but it's the largest oil boom in modern U.S. history. It was a huge oil discovery. It really reshaped the lives of, you know, millions of people. I mean, people from all over the country were there. It's just, you say North Dakota, and people are kind of allergic to that word. It's like, it's, it's not a, a glamorous place. Right. How know? many people are in North Dakota, for example? There's more and people in Philadelphia, twice as many people in Philadelphia right. as live in the entire, entire state, state of North Dakota. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, was there, I was there once on a camping trip, and uh, uh, the joke in the car was, we didn't know where we were going, the joke in the car was, all right, just drive into the middle of North Dakota and take a left. <laughs> uh, so, you know, East Coast bias right there. Um, okay, so let's, um, l let's open up. We have questions um, on anything that we've talked about or anything that we have not touched on. We have... Uh, Two of our number right up here. Oh, and then when you, Deb, when you then pass it back. Are yeah. there any other surprises that you haven't spoken about that wouldn't ruin the book? You know, give too much information away. But were you surprised by anything else? You talked about the patriarchal aspect. Yes. Um, yeah. Actually, one of the themes of the book is being constantly shocked and surprised. <laughs> Um, it's a it's a really weird place where you frequently you'll come in with all these assumptions about what something will be like, and then it turns out to be the opposite. Um, and a lot of people there had very shifty backgrounds, so you never knew quite who you were talking to. And I just remember being shocked. This is one of many, many, many examples. But um, you know, one guy was interviewing about something unrelated, and uh, halfway through, he just confesses that he's a convicted sex offender. Uh, there's a lot of sex offenders that went to the oil field because that's the only place they could get work. Um, <laughs> but I've, I've seen that at every level. You know, one guy looked him up. Uh, I Googled him, and he was under investigation by the SEC for fraud. No clue. Um, and, and so this happened a lot, just, just never knowing who you're dealing with, people having these shifty pasts, um, people at all levels. Were you you mean with, with sources or with? Well, the people you're just referring oh. to. <laughs> I mean, was there a reason you didn't want them to go down those? Um, I often hung out with people in groups, but sometimes, uh, you know, you have to be alone with them. Um, I, some of the people I met who were sex offenders have actually never bothered me. <laughs> some of the, you know, uh, it's, it's just that like, you never really get a sense just because someone looks shifty or has a shifty background that they will act that way to you. Um, it, was, it was very strange, but I I, it did make me much more aware of, of trying to read people, um, mm -hmm. trying to be aware of who's out there. You know, um, if, um, well, I'll just add one quick thing and then we'll go to your question. I think something you said right at the top of your answer about uh, constantly being surprised or going into situations and then all of a sudden discovering new things about it. That if there's any advertisement that I can make for journalism, and also in my own experience, is that that's one of the joys of it a lot, mm -hmm. is to put yourself in these situations where you absolutely have no idea what's going to happen, and then things, and you meet people, or you're in situations which you never could have imagined that you were in, and you would never have had any kind of exposure yeah. to if you had a desk job somewhere. Yeah, and it's, I think it's good to be surprised, because that means that you've, you're not just going with your own um, preconceived notions. You're open to being in the field and seeing where that leads. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sir. Um, first, I want to congratulate you on the book. I thought I really enjoyed reading it. Um, to my mind, I guess there were two parts of it. You have the sort of, as you, you know, the unbridled capitalist greed thing that you're mm -hmm. very clear about. And then you have this array of characters that you discovered there, um, often sort of losers or maybe hard luck lives of these people. And I just, reading it, I wondered, do those two parts actually come together? That is to say, is it because of the unbridled capitalism attracting these kind of 
low life or is where sort of the necessity to tell a good story sort of predisposing you to focus on these particular characters that might not have been typical. They didn't seem like, to me, typical people, I guess I'm saying, in some sense. But I, I wondered if you grappled with that or if that just seemed that was the story. Yeah, um, so I spent enough time there to make sure that I was not trying to pick people that were way out of left field or that were, um, I would say the people I wrote about are typical for that area. Um, and that I think that uh, yeah, that unbridled capitalism does draw um, those people on the margins. They, they come there to get a job because it's hard for them anywhere else or to start over or to um, kind of run new scams and Ponzi schemes and drug trafficking rings. Um, but yeah, that, that the headlines about all this unlimited opportunity, they draw you know, obviously plenty of hardworking good people and, and good entrepreneurs, but they also draw uh, you know, everyone else, people who are more predatory. But it seems like you did focus on the predatory, right? Or, or you don't think you did? Well, I mean, I was also coming out there, you know, to to investigate. The, like, I wasn't just doing like human interest stories. So, um, you know, I, I feel like the the guy Danny I wrote about the main character. He's had some issues in his past, but he's pretty hardworking. He's not harming anybody. Um, and then there were other people there, you know, who were definitely coming to. Um, maybe take advantage of the fact that, that Western North Dakota is a very trusting place where they could, it's remote and they could kind of blend in there and, and try to profit there. I thought, go ahead. I guess I have one other question, and that's yeah. about the title of the yeah. book. Because the word, I don't think that phrase occurs anywhere in the book, the, gr the Great American Outpost. <laughs> there was the Great American Lodge, I think. Yes. And the word outpost just, didn't work for me. I mean, I thought it was mm -hmm. a very strange title. And I was wondering if it was your own or, or someone suggested it to you or? Um, I had some other titles that I had thought about and my editor didn't like. And then I came up with this. I, I thought it was an outpost. It just reminded me of a colonial outpost far in the Western frontier. Um, and then the Great American Outpost, um, you know, the, the first two words, Great American, that was sort of a play on um, Great American Lodge. It's sort of ironic. And for everyone who hasn't read the book, um, Great American Lodge is this man camp development that was part of a worldwide Ponzi scheme in the North Dakota oil field that drew foreign investors from around the globe um, who put in millions of dollars and then uh, wound up being a scam. So in newspaper writing, at least in news stories, you usually make sure you're not in the story. And I haven't read the book. Mm -hmm. In the book, did you choose to put yourself in? And why, if you did or didn't put yourself in? Yeah, I put myself in to some degree, but I, not to the point that it was a memoir. But um, yeah, I think like when, you, when you're doing a book like this, you don't have to follow those typical conventions of leaving yourself out. I think especially if you're writing about a place that's more of an unusual place that people, that would seem really different to, to a lot of readers, uh, it's helpful to put yourself in as kind of this guide or someone to kind of explain and translate. And, and I felt like sometimes I would be shocked or surprised or, or kind of taken aback by something and it was helpful to tell readers how I felt in those situations or how I might identify with someone. Um, and I actually, originally I wanted to put a lot more of myself in, but then I found that was kind of slowing down the pace of the book. It was, um, it was uh, muddling things and, and so I pulled back more than I thought. But um, I think it's a case by case basis. There's some books where it really would make sense to put a lot of yourself in and others it's not necessary. Yeah, I thought I get the rule of thumb kind of for that sort of thing is uh, um, if it can help drive the narrative forward, it's good. If the I voice gets in the way of the narrative too much about yourself, then it's not good. Um, and I noticed with Danny, you know, Danny's telling his story, and then somewhere along the way there, you start, you, you, you mention that you're sitting in the cab with him as he's talking yeah. for hours. And if you hadn't done that, 
it might have looked like, you know, how do we know where did all this information about Danny's mm -hmm. background come from? You know, but that, you, you managed to sort of work in a piece of attribution there and then go yeah. back to Danny um, in that yeah. first, this first couple chapters. Uh, yeah. I saw, uh, yes. Hi, thank you for coming, first of all. Um, I, you said you were working uh, as a cashier at a truck stop, and to me that seems like it would have like a lot of passing or service level interaction. So I was just wondering how you went about diagnosing who was uh, worth connecting with or uh, talking with further. Yeah, so, it, so an oil field truck stop, I would say it's, it's different than a truck stop in, on the interstates in many places because the same people do keep coming back. It's in a more enclosed area. Um, but I, I would just try to make small talk with people at the cash register, and if they seemed interesting or friendly or, or outgoing, then I would get their number and then try to meet with them after their shift or meet with them later. And, um, uh, and I met with Danny um, at some point just, just to go on with him with, uh, on his shift for three hours, and he was very, very talkative and very open. And so I was really excited about him but then for a while after, I had a very hard time connecting with him. So I moved on to other, other oil workers and other characters. And um, I came back to him later when I had a chance. He, he finally was able to give me more access. So I, you have to actually talk to a lot of different people and spend enough time there to figure out what would be a good story to tell. And there were actually a lot of people in the oil field. Um, they have very interesting backstories, but then there's nothing interesting happening to them in the oil field. And so I would try to make sure there was something interesting that they were doing in the oil field itself that, that hadn't been written about too much or that they, it, it could sort of um, intersect with something that was a harder hitting topic. So for Danny, one of the things about him that I get into later in the book was um, he really became a whistleblower for the dangerous working conditions there. Um, there was a way to look at his trajectory to look at the, just how pipelines were displacing trucks to look at um, just all kinds of different issues. And so even though I think there were some aspects of his life that weren't as sympathetic, I could have found somebody else. You know, I didn't necessarily, I think it would have been great to find a female truck driver, for example. There weren't as many, but um, maybe I could have looked harder. Um, but at the end of the day, I just wanted to go with who would have these stories that could, that could touch on bigger themes, who could open up to me in some way. So, um, yeah, you have to talk to a lot of people, though, to figure that out. So I didn't make any choices early on necessarily about who, um, who I'm going to stick with right away. That thing you said about uh, you know, having to talk to a lot of people in order to figure it out, um, you have to, generally speaking, uh, whether it's for, I think, even an individual piece of journalism that's no longer than a 1,000 words or a book, you have to gather a lot more material you know, than you're going to use. Um, yeah. How much of the material, so you can, so that you can choose from strength. Um, how much of the material that you gathered did not end up in the book? I mean, percentage-wise, roughly speaking. I would think probably seventy percent. Seven zero. Okay. Yeah, I mean, just because you, yeah. if you're there for a year, you're going to meet so many interesting people and take so many notes, <laughs> and it's very painful actually to put a lot of it aside. Um, but sometimes, like when you're figuring out how to winnow it down, you. Um, I mean, I try to make sure that I'm not being too repetitive. Like, I met some other really interesting truck drivers. I really wanted to put more of them in, and I realized, oh, that's just going to feel too redundant with this other guy I have. Um, you know, and I wanted to make sure I was getting in a good, just a good mix of people. I wanted to get in some, you know, white-collar people as well. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, there was just a lot I had to leave in, and sometimes... You don't really totally lose that reporting. You just you'll summarize it in just a couple of paragraphs. Sometimes it's just being able to say something really declaratively in you know one page. Right. But yeah, it's really <laughs> it's really hard to actually think about how much you know I couldn't really fit in. Right, right. But sometimes that stuff is like it's behind the words. You know. Yeah. It can help your sense of authority and your confidence. Oh yeah. Uh, even if it's not there on the page, so it's not like yeah. the work goes for nothing. Right. right. Uh, that's what we tell ourselves anyway. <laughs> um, we have time for a few more questions from anybody. On any of this? Yes, sir. Here's the, here's the mic. Thank you for coming. I, I'm just curious, can you tell us about the mechanics of getting a book deal as a, as a reporter? 
So you have to get an agent, and then for a nonfiction book, you have to write a book proposal. So mine was about 70 pages. Um, you have to sort of write about kind of an outline of how you think it'll go. You write um, kind of a submit some sample chapters, uh, submit some thoughts you have on publicity. So it's this whole thing. It's different than fiction. With fiction, you have to do your man you just turn in your full manuscript after it's already done, and they'll buy that. But with nonfiction, you're just giving them basically a plan of how you will do it. Um, and that's kind of weird, because at the end of the day, my, my book had the same themes as my book proposal, but it, it, a lot of it did change. Um, because you can't really know until you're actually out in the field and you finish your reporting. Um, so there's just a little bit of speculation that can go into that. Uh, more questions? Um, let me, actually, let me turn back the clock on, on uh, is, we were talking about the transition from being a reporter to having a book project. Let's turn back the clock a little farther. You graduated college in 2006, mm -hmm. yeah? All right, so how did, you, how did you make the successful navigation from college into the actual paid working world of journalism? How did that work? Send out a million applications, what? <laughs> I just went on journalismjobs.com. <laughs> the press of Atlantic City was hiring. Uh, so I just got, got a job there, and that was a really great paper, because um, it was just a great news town. So being, actually being in the North Dakota oil field reminded me of being in Atlantic City. <laughs> it, I felt like it prepared me a lot, because Atlantic City's also this kind of <laughs> seen as a backwater outpost that draws these real characters and um, con men and things like that, and uh, it's uh, kind of in the shadows of Philly and sort of forgotten. Um, and so, so I, I, that sort of helped prepare me for what I would eventually do. But from anyway, from there, I worked there for a year, and um, I was working really hard. I wanted to get to a big paper, and then someone from the Enquirer they knew they were looking for people to to um, help cover South Jersey, and then they noticed my work and and uh, invited me to apply. So w were you in, did you work on your college paper? Did you have, clip, uh, I did, did you uh, have clips to show when you were yes, applying I, I to Atlantic City? Yes, I had some City? internships. Um, they weren't really that prestigious, but I had some. Like I, I, I worked for some small papers and, and I had some clips there. And I did some in the college paper as well. Yeah, so it's step yeah. by step. It is definitely yeah. a step by step process. Um, last question, anybody? Right here. I have so many questions I want to ask you, but um, <laughs> I kind of just two. Can I get sure. first of all a brief one? Um, how was it received with your from your sources? Did you send them the book? Anybody you spoke with, or in that I area, did they do sure. re book reviews? Or I haven't heard from everyone, but I've heard from most of them. Uh, you know, I heard from from Danny, the truck driver, and, and some other folks. So I, they all said they generally liked it. They didn't. I, I, I hadn't heard any complaints so far. But I think that's because um, often, especially if someone's going to be in there um, a lot, like I do go over things with them and um, kind of just make sure they're not surprised. So uh, yeah, I think it's important with this kind of book, um, especially if you're not trying to, uh, so it's not a traditional news story where I don't think you, with the traditional news story, you don't feel as much of a need to go over every last thing with everybody. But with, with the book, especially if someone, sometimes I would get worried, for example, about people, do they really mean to tell me something that seemed like too, a little bit too personal? So I would go back and check, and, um, even just, just for legal reasons, and just trying to make sure, um, are you really sure you want this out in the world about your ex-wife or your kid or whatever? Um, so yeah, so far that's been okay. Uh, some people in Western North Dakota thought it was negative, a, a negative portrayal of the area, and then others really liked it. So, uh, and I'm still waiting to hear, you know, from everybody. All right, and my other question is um, more about the mechanics of, of reporting. Mm -hmm. I'm a lot older than you, but I used to be yeah. a reporter as well. Um, and I found it interesting what you were when you were interviewing Danny and you got your laptop out, because I found... I, you know, when you're interviewing people, there's the obstruction of the recorder. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm dating myself also. Um, yeah. I guess you use your phone now, right? Yeah. Which I think is easier because as a reporter, I found when you put your recorder there, people would be, you know, taken aback. Um, oh, yeah. But I understand, even like writing notes, I think this is good for new students. Like, 
people don't like the notebook in front of them often too, but you want to get that flavor. Like when you would go out with a group of people, say at a bar or whatever, and you want to remember those conversations, you want to capture it, and you want to be part of it, but you don't necessarily want to be scribbling on your notebook in front mm -hmm. of them because it really sets you apart as a reporter. Oh yeah. Right, so how did you deal with that? Like did you put your recorder on that, your phone on then or? I know you don't want to, tra I used to oh. transcribe forever too and it's, it's, <laughs> a, it's horrible, it takes forever, but you might miss yeah. that nuanced quote too, you know? Yeah, and I should just clarify like, so when I do this sometimes with Danny, you know, he's driving his truck and I'm sitting in a passenger seat so it's not as obtrusive as when he's sitting across a table or sometimes, well, everyone there used to like to be interviewed at a bar. So I would just put the laptop on a bar and type as a, at, like next to them. If, if I knew it was gonna be a long interview, um, but yeah, I think people just, I actually like to have my notebook out and be more conspicuous because, again, I think like you know, if I live in this environment and I'm not doing a, um, a story for the next day's paper or next week, it's, I'm like telling them uh, that this is gonna come out in three years, people kind of sometimes can get too comfortable and then they might start saying things that they just start blabbing about. And I always want them to know like there is a reporter this, it, this could be used in a book, just to just for my own ethical sense of, uh, of just ethical peace of mind, I guess. I worry about people sometimes, um, they just kind of forget after a while that you're a reporter because they've known, they keep seeing you and there's nothing that's ever in print and they start thinking that you're their friend or you know, not, you're their therapist <laughs> after a long day of work. So you, I actually like to always keep something out that reminds people. And people would get sometimes get annoyed, like put your notebook away, but um, so I, you have to balance that too. But yeah, I try to always just make people remember this could end up in a book. Um, so what, all right, well I want, first of all, I wanna thank everybody for being here the whole time. But what do you, um, What's next, Maya? What, you, you mentioned that, you know, for your next project you'd like to generally, but do you sort of see yourself long-term as wanting to write books and get out of the newspaper day-to-day? -day? Is that your master plan to the extent you may have one? Um, yeah, I'd like to continue to write books on the side. Um, I think after this project, um, I've sort of learned what could work and, and what's, what takes too much time. I mean, being in rural America, as popular as this is after Trump was elected and everyone w wants to report in rural America, it's a lot of driving. I say all my time was, all my time was transcribing and driving. So if I can cut that out, uh, <laughs> and if, we can, if, if I can find a way to still use some of those skills and do it in a, in a way that's just logistically easier, you know, in one city or one or smaller group of people, um, yeah, I think I, w I would like to continue writing. I haven't picked a topic yet, but. I'm well, still kind of recuperating. Trust your trust your instincts. Let's yeah. wish Maya well. And thank yeah. you all for being here. <laughs>